All right, welcome everyone. We're just going to give it a minute or two so people can get logged in. Thank you for joining us for this session. I see people rolling in, but we'll give it another minute. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for being with us. Uh, welcome to the second installment of our Affordable Housing 101 Back to Basics webinar series. We have three more sessions coming up this month uh, in the following week, so there is still time to register for those. I'll put that in the chat. But today we're covering the economics of affordable housing development, including cost drivers and how nonprofit developers provide long-term affordability. And you're good hands today because our speakers are two former board presidents of SCAMF, and you'll greatly benefit from their expertise. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to hand it off to Tara and Nicole to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their organization. So let's get this party started. Uh, Tara and Nicole, if you want to introduce yourselves. I sure do. Um, I can go ahead. So good afternoon, everyone. So excited you're joining us. Um, I'm Nicole Narori with California Housing Partnership. And I'm the director of financial consulting for the Central Coast region. Um, CHPC, as we're commonly known, is a private nonprofit organization that was started in 1988. And we call ourselves California's experts in sustainable, affordable housing, finance, and policy. Um, and we are unique in that we combine on the ground technical assistance and policy leadership, both at the state and national level to increase the supply of affordable homes in California. We are definitely um, public mission driven and we want to provide housing that is sustainable and affordable to working families, homeless, veterans, seniors, and the disabled. So. Uh, for those low-income folks across the state. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tara Borowskis. I'm the Executive Director of Community Corp of Santa Monica. We're a nonprofit organization that was formed in 1982. Our mission is improving lives and neighborhoods by providing affordable housing in high opportunity areas. And we just celebrated our 40th anniversary and um, we've built over 40, uh, sorry, 1900 units of affordable housing, um, primarily in Santa Monica, but we did build our first building in the city of Los Angeles a couple of years ago. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we started as a nonprofit organization and we still a uh, nonprofit sort of community based organization. Um, we were formed by activists in the room, you know, who are concerned about gentrification and we very much keep our community roots and um, we like to do everything ourselves and really be connected with the community. We currently have several projects under construction in Santa Monica, as well as one that just started in the city of Los Angeles in Westchester. So this is just, um, we're going to start with a little bit about our work. And so this is just to demonstrate where all of our buildings are. So one of our key principles is that we really want to focus on um, improving life circumstances for our residents. And that means being in high resource neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, we really had started out in Santa Monica. So, you know, as you can see, we're near the ocean. So it's a, a wonderful coastal community with high quality schools. Uh, transit, we've got the expo line, uh, and a variety of job opportunities. So it certainly fits in with the idea of putting housing where jobs and transit are. So we'll show you a little bit about um, what our model is, some specific examples of the types of buildings we build, and we can talk a little bit about the benefits that um, nonprofit groups like us bring. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different terms for affordable housing that are bandied about. Um, our specific one has to do, like I said, with um, putting um, permanent affordable housing um, into neighborhoods that don't have it currently. And, you know, nonprofits all have sort of a different angle that we work on. And this is just, you know, community corps um, 
the way that we approach it, but um, certainly all of us have that same idea of providing that permanent, high quality, affordable housing. Um, oh, somebody's saying that the screen is still blank. So hopefully that could be fixed because we do want to show some of these images. Um, we, the, one of the things that I think is really wonderful about nonprofit affordable housing developers, not to be biased, is that um, we really um, put mission at the forefront of our work. So we focus a lot on some of the principles that we're aspiring to have uh, embedded in our project. So for environmental, uh, for example, environmental sustainability is one of our key principles. So we make sure to infuse that into all of our buildings. Um, so the rents for our affordable housing model and many of us nonprofits in the area, um, they are sized to a person's income. So that is how we try to maintain long-term uh, economic sustainability. So it's basically sized to 30% of a person's income so that the rest of their income can be used for the other household needs that they have, such as food and transportation and those kinds of things. Um, so for us, we focus on lower income households from 30 to 80% of the area median income. And so that translates into rents that start at about $450 a month, all the way to about $1,500 dollars a month. And the reason for that large range is that we offer one, two, and three bedrooms. And so the rents can be sized to the number of people in the household and then the size of the unit. So for example, one person household at a 30% area median income would be paying the 450. And then say four or five people in a three bedroom would be paying more like 1500. Um, and just to translate that into how that compares with market rate rents, at least on the West side, as you probably all know, it's horrendously expensive. Right now, market rate for, I would say, a two bedroom is probably at least 3000 a month. Um, that's if you're lucky, maybe more than that. So you can see that this is vastly affordable compared to the market. The typical household um, income range that we serve starts anywhere at about 18,000 a month, and it goes to 80 or 90,000 a month, depending on uh, a year, I'm sorry, depending on the number of people in the household. So that could be, say, one breadwinner who's supporting an entire family of four or five people, or that could be, you know, one person making minimum wage or living on social security. And you know, we serve a wide range of people, including families, seniors, and homeless individuals. Okay, so let's show you some examples. Um, so this is our most recently completed building that just completed last month. It's called Las Flores. It's in the city of Santa Monica. And one thing that was really great about this building, besides the design and um, the affordability and everything, is this was a direct product of AB 1763. And I'll explain why that's important. So we had originally purchased this property and envisioned building a 55 unit affordable housing building. But then AB 1763 passed, which allows up to three additional floors of housing with no additional entitlement work or parking. And um, so we decided for this one that we would add another floor of housing. So it got to be 73 units. The reason we decided that is that um, we thought, okay, we can do that without too much disruption to all the community work we've already done. So we had, you know, sort of already presented this 55 unit building. So we thought, okay, that's not significantly different. It's still in scale with the neighborhood and it doesn't materially change, you know, too much about the project. So we were able to very easily do that. And that alone reduced our project cost by 10%. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about some of that, but um, basically we have fixed costs on some of our buildings and then we have per unit costs. So something like land is a fixed cost, which means you pay what? one cost, say $10 million, no matter how many units you put on it. So right away, you can see if you can spread the costs and provide more units that that is a more cost efficient strategy. So, so that's something unique about this property. 
So let's go on. Um, so we build new construction and rehabilitation as well. So um, there are benefits to buying buildings and um, maintaining people's residency and being able to restore them to their original beauty. So this building was almost 100 years old, and that's what we did. Um, and I will say one of the things about that 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 is wonderful is that really gets a lot of community acceptance um, because people see this as a way to stabilize neighborhoods and stabilize people so that that you know prevents displacement and it also just keeps that neighborhood character that um, places like Santa Monica care about so so we have you know probably 40 of these kinds of buildings in our portfolio as well um, and then there's inclusionary housing with some of you may have heard this term um, and basically it means that for market rate developments that happen in a city, um, they must also provide for some affordable housing. Now this looks different in every city, I will say I feel like Santa Monica has one of the most progressive policies with regard to inclusionary housing. Um, which means that um, not only do they have a higher percentage requirement, um, but also they have a variety of means by which you can accomplish that requirement. So I think that that is really key to making a successful program. So in the case of this building, this um, building was part of a larger market rate development called 500 Broadway um, that was over 300 market rate units. And so that translated into 64 units of an affordable housing requirement. So what the market rate developer did is purchase the land for us and provided gap financing. So this 100% affordable 64 unit building was built with no city funding. Um, which means that city funding can be used for other projects. So it stretches the dollars, and you've all heard that term leveraging. Um, but certainly it is it is a huge benefit um, to both the city for you know being able to produce more affordable housing, but also for the residents to get to live in this beautiful building. And I really love the design of this one. It was lead platinum, so highly environmentally sustainable, uh, but also they really focused on a lot of air and light. Um, and it's on Lincoln Boulevard, so you know they're there's some pluses and minuses to that location, but it really turned out wonderful and, and people are really happy living there. So if there are questions about inclusionary housing specifically, we might talk about that later on. So next slide, please. And, um, you know, another type uh, of affordable housing is modular housing. And I know you've all probably heard about some of these types of projects, which are built in factories. So we have our own that we will be starting. We just paid the deposit to the modular factory. It's a small building. It'll be 13 units for transition aged youth and families. So um, I know there's a few developers who have tried to do that, and I, I guess I'll say the verdict is still out as to whether that's really going to be the game changer that brings down costs over time. But the only way to find out is to try it and um, build those partnerships and see if we can and really accomplish that. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just an, an example of how we try to make sure that our buildings um, provide a high quality of living for our residents. So, um, you know, sometimes there's this misconception in communities that affordable housing is substandard or that it, they're dark or depressing. Um, and certainly I would like to say that's not the case. So um, this is one of our buildings. It's on Virginia Avenue. It's across the school, uh, the street from a school, Edison, which which is one of the best schools in Santa Monica, from what I've heard. Um, and so we focus on, you know, creating lots of natural air and light and high quality appliances, um, you know, sort of making sure that it's a place where anybody would feel happy to live. So and because they're permanently affordable, we do try to make sure that there are high quality materials that will be durable over time. Um, and one key component to the nonprofit model in particular is that we provide a variety of affordable, um, affordable meaning no cost, so the most affordable um, supportive services for our residents and, um, you know, every nonprofit might have a slightly different way of doing it. Um, we try to fill in the gaps that we think our households are facing, and we do that by a survey. So when people move in, we ask them, what, what are the needs that you're experiencing or the lack of resources? 
um, you know, pretty much across the board, there's a need for support for after school programs. So, you know, tutoring, um, support with academic enrichment, um, and different types of maybe field trips, different types of things to provide more academic support. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of need for is health and wellness um, opportunities, so access to fresh produce, fitness classes, um, community connection. So that's the way we structure our um, supportive services. They're done on site. They're all free to our residents. And we so we have very intentional focus areas to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our residents. So let's talk about our model specifically and why it's important. So as, as I started to touch on, we really do put mission and our residents at the center of everything we do. So we really try to think about how do we create spaces that will accomplish our goals? So for example, we wanna create health and wellness. So we wanna make sure there's things like access to air and light. We wanna make sure that there are ample spaces for the services that we wanna provide. Um, we frequently engage our resident council to look at the plans to make sure that there isn't something we haven't thought through, like, you know, placement of, of community spaces or where the manager's unit is, floor plans, things like that. Um, they are permanently affordable, and that is a huge benefit to Los Angeles and all the other places that have our type of housing. Um, you know, we do have covenants on our affordable housing, which um, are placed on the property by the funding partners that we work with. And at the end of that covenant, which is, it could be 55 years, in my, you know, in the old days, it was 30 years, um, but now it could even be 99 years. And at the end of that covenant, the nonprofit community is not going to um, flip these to market. So uh, it is in our articles and our bylaws and the way we were organized that we must keep these permanently affordable. So, you know, in the city of Los Angeles, there is quite a, an epidemic of properties that are coming out of their covenants and what's going to happen to those units. They're considered at risk of turning to market, but these that are uh, operated by the affordable uh, nonprofit profit affordable housing developers will not. So that's, I think, one of the largest benefits. Um, and then we do work with many public and private partners. So we work with many city agencies, probably many of you um, are part of those, and we really value those partnerships because we can't do it without all of you. Um, and also we have relationships with private lenders. So banks, small CDFIs, um, they're, they're also involved in our projects, large tax credit investors. So it really is um, a collaboration that I think is really, um, it's wonderful, but it's also sustainable. So all these groups coming together have this model that's been working for decades. All right, so we'll continue on. Um, so I don't know, Nicole, maybe you want to chime in a little bit on some of the benefits you see. So it's not just me saying all these great things about the nonprofit model. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the unique things is that, you know, the nonprofit affordable housing model really serves to meet a need in the community. And oftentimes, um, nonprofit, you know, affordable housing developers are the first to kind of come into a neighborhood, um, especially neighborhoods that may have suffered from uh, disinvestment, neglect, um, and provide this housing for their residents. And then, you know, oftentimes these neighborhoods may be going through transition, gentrification, uh, but with nonprofit housing developers, they really ensure that, um, you know, folks that are living there have access to this housing um, that is affordable to them. And, you know, nonprofit housing developers really care about the community. So they go, you know, um, in and work with the community. I know this because, you know, pre previously before I was at CHPC, I was an affordable housing developer um, that worked mostly for nonprofits. Um, and as Tara said, you know, it's not just about, about providing housing, but even depending on some of the programs that may fund this, 
um, there may be other um, improvements that are going beyond the walls of the residential housing. There might be community improvements. Um, I know I worked in a rural community and worked on a site that provided um, a safe route to school so that kids would have a, you know, a sidewalk um, to get to school and didn't have to use a dirt road. Um, you know, in major urban cities, this could be, you know, some sidewalk improvements, lighting improvements, greenery improvements, um, urban greenscape, that type of thing. So I think um, one thing that, you know, the nonprofit housing developers do is they're always willing to go above and beyond because, again, they're very much driven by mission. Um, so why does the nonprofit housing model is... Um, uh, matter, because we must continue to sort of, you know, have this narrative that affordable housing is not just housing, it truly is a home and a community investment and part of the community infrastructure um, that is needed in every community across the state. So affordable housing, you know, it's not just needed in certain type of communities, it really is statewide um, and even communities perhaps where rents aren't as high as they may be in coastal areas, larger metropolitan urban areas, you still see families that are needing an affordable rent. Um, and I kind of touched on this a little bit, but it provides important investments in the communities and for what it does cost, you know, it helps um, the public good because again, you don't have families that are um, living in conditions where they're tripling up. This happens a lot, you know, I'm based in the Central Coast and here what we see is families living in garages, um, which is not how, you know, we would want a family to, to live and, um, or families tripling up in you know very small spaces. You have three families, um, and so by moving into housing that they can afford, um, this you know helps to stabilize a family and gives them more opportunities for a long term future. Great points. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about what is affordable housing. And as Tara said, you know, there's this gets thrown around a, a bunch, but at its most basic, affordable housing is affordable to rent. And it's affordable to rent to families that are not at, you know, moderate, high, but really in those lower incomes. And why does that matter? So every year CHPC does um, releases a housing needs report and um, we do this by counties um, and then we do a California statewide. And what we found like for our report in 2023 is that the median rent in California has increased 38% since 2000 while median renter household incomes have only increased by 7%. This is adjusted for inflation. Um, and I think we all feel, you know, the burden of costs going up. Um, we can see it with gas prices. We can see it with gross groceries. Certainly the housing market, if, you know, luckily I got in a while ago, but if I were to try to buy a home today, I'm not sure I could do it. But you can imagine if you're, um, a low income household, extremely low income household, how having to go out there and pay, you know, 3000 for a two bedroom apartment. I mean, that just impacts folks quality of life and their potential um, for success in the future, because they're having to make some really tough choices, you know, rent, health, um, so when the rent is affordable, that means the family hopefully has some additional disposable income and can take care of their health needs, can, you know, maybe sign their kid up for Little League or just, um, you know, maybe able to provide the backpack they need for school, things like that. So it, it's um, really important that at its most fundamental the housing that we're providing is affordable to the families that are living there. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in on that too, is that um, one thing that sometimes people don't know is that you income qualify someone when they first move in. But if their income grows over time, if they improve their circumstances with a better job or whatever that may be, they don't have to leave. So it's not, it is permanent housing. So sometimes I hear out in the community, oh, well, you're pigeonholing people into poverty and forcing them to stay in this kind of housing, which first of all, isn't bad housing. But, you know, to counteract that argument, I always tell people you can improve your circumstances. And we have seen it where someone gets a much better job, they're able to save up and move out or they're um, and buy, buy a condo or something, or they're able to send their kid to college, for example. So it, it really is a wonderful model in that regard. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that nonprofits more frequently take Section 8 or much more willingly than some of our counterparts, um, which helps the people whose incomes fall below that range that I gave you earlier. So I, I saw a question in the chat about that. So if you do, if you are like below poverty or below that extremely low income level, you still could have an opportunity to live in our housing because we, you know, happily take section eight, both tenant-based and project-based. Yeah. And one thing like, you know, and the data consistently shows, um, so in our report, that 79%, which is a really high percentage of extremely low income renters, uh, are paying more than half of their income on housing costs compared to 6% of moderate income renter households. So that's why CHPC is very much focused on the low income households. And Black renter households, for example, are also 41% more severely cost burdened than white renter households. So the need um, is pretty severe. How this housing is financed is, you know, the developers set the, the rents and, you know, pretty much I would say most nonprofit housing um, affordable developers that we work with do target um, the low income folks um, and set those rents at the lower levels. And as Tara you know, said earlier, this could be from 80% AMI to 30% um, AMI, which is the extremely low. Um, so these low rents, because the rents are set low so the folks can afford to pay them because they do have to pay their rent, um, generate what's known as low net operating income. So the property does need to generate income in order to sustain itself, but um, the income it's generating, you know, it's just supportable by these low rents. And with this low income, then they get smaller um, conventional mortgages. Um, so what this income, which is generated by the rents, helps to give the property is a mortgage, just like, you know, some of us may have mortgages. Um, and that mortgage is really small and it doesn't cover the full cost of um, financing the building, uh, whether it's new construction or rehab for the total, you know, all the costs involved for the development. Um, so because there's a small mortgage, then there's a need for public subsidy. Um, so this is where, the local um, folks come in, city, county, could be state, federal to a certain extent, though we've seen that less and less, um, but there's still very good uh, federal programs out there that provide that public subsidy that kind of fill what we call gap financing. Yeah, Nicole, if I could just add on to what you were saying, sometimes I get questions out in the community, well, why can't this project just be smaller? Um, and that is because of kind of what Nicole was saying is that our rents are really low. So our operating cash, which is that net operating income is low. And, but it has to be positive, right? So the way we model these is every building is its own business entity and is self-sustaining. That's one of the successful aspects of this model is it is modeled to take in the rents that it can collect, even though they're low rents and pay all of its bills. So, you know, I'm working on a few projects on the West side where the neighbors are like, well, can you just take two stories off? And then it becomes a small project. The cash flow doesn't pencil over time. So I try to explain that in that, you know, we have low rents, therefore we need more units and economies of scale to make it not only pencil on the upfront construction side, but long-term. Right. 
because yeah, we want these buildings, these properties, these investments to be healthy for the foreseeable future, because if something happens, then who gets most impacted are the folks that are living there. And it's not easy if you're low income, extremely low income to just go out, stay in your neighborhood and find some place to rent. Um, so affordable housing is financed. It's very complex and very complicated. And this is what I do day to day. Um, so, you know, there used to be a time when projects were pretty much what we call a vanilla project. Um, and now just with the complexity, you know, projects have become more and more complex. Um, and part of this is because there's multiple levels of financing that is needed. Um, and that's kind of one of the cost drivers with these projects is that um, in order to finance these projects and finance means you're either building a whole new building or you're doing substantial rehab work um, on an existing building, then um, you need money to pay for all of that. And it's pretty expensive because just in general, it's very expensive to build in California. This is the reason why housing, whether you know it's ownership or rental, costs so much. Um, so this is typically called the capital stack, and it's capital dollars, so dollar for dollar, that's going to help you build um, or rehab your building. And it involves multiple layers. Um, so here we have this uh, example, that typical funding stack for affordable housing projects. The funding sources, so what's going to bring in the money to help you build your project is there's going to be some debt involved. Um, so this is going to most of the major banks that we're all familiar with. Um, and this is borrowed money. And usually the lender is, you know, getting some kind of profit, you know, um, from this loan that they're making. And there's typically some collateral involved. So that's a small piece of it, of course. Um, no lender is going to give you 100% of what you need. Um, so they're a you know, big part, but... Well, we wouldn't mind that, but that's not how the system <laughs> right. is set up. Um, and then there's equity, and equity really refers to the private investment dollars that are brought in when you know, a project secures tax credits, which here it says you know, the main source of funding is through the low-income housing tax credit. So Nowadays, we do have different models that um, are able to um, move forward without low-income housing tax credits, but that's like one out of, I don't know, the majority of projects. The majority are going to go through the low-income housing tax credit system. And so developers go and compete for these credits, and there's a 9% credit, which is the competitive program, and there's a 4% credit. 9% is a higher percentage than 4%. Um, so 9% projects uh, bring in more equity. However, 4% credits, they're not competitive, but they have to be married with bonds, which um, I don't know, like when the bond system went competitive, but it used to not be competitive and now it's highly competitive. So this is a very competitive system um, that developers have to go and apply for. And like, you know, with the 9% program, there's only two times a year that developers can apply. With the non-competitive, but the competitive bonds, it's three times a year. So once they secure these tax credits, then an investor comes in and provides um, private capital dollars. And usually this is one of the largest um, sources of the financing. So you might get like 10 million from the city, uh, but really the equity is gonna generate perhaps like $20 million. So you can see that um, it's, you know, one of the most important. Uh, and then there's also public and soft financing. And that's what um, they get from the local folks um, or state or federal government. And, that's usually the first layer that comes in. So before you go out and get debt and you compete for tax credits, um, you're trying to compete for local financing. 
because that's usually your first relationship, your first partnership, you're building in the city, like, you know, Tara builds in the city of Santa Monica. She, they know her, she knows the folks there, uh, and they want to support developments in their communities. So they may put out a NOFA. Uh, most of these are competitive and she'll try to secure this funding. Once she does that, let's say she gets 2 million, then she goes up the next level, which the next level in our field is usually going to the state and that's HCD for their numerous programs. And what makes this you know, extremely difficult and not the most efficient is all these funding cycles are on different timing. Um, so, you know, if you weren't able, let's say the city had a NOFA and you didn't secure that funding for whatever reason, well, then you can't really apply to the next step, which is the state. So you might have to sit out around. So as we all know, time is money. And so this means that, you know, most affordable housing nonprofit developers get a loan when they have a site and are planning to build. And so they're paying interest on this loan when they're just sitting on the property waiting um, to build. And what also makes it extremely difficult is that all these funding sources have different policy priorities. Um, you know, the locals like City of LA has its own funding priorities. Um, State HCD has a funding priority. Um, like this priority, for example, uh, could be, you know, the state wants to act with urgency to address homelessness and housing stability. So they have a requirement that whatever is going to get billed sets aside a certain percentage of units for um, homeless households. So uh, this takes time and it's a highly competitive system. I mean, for the supernova that the state released last July for MHP, which is multi-housing family program funds, it was oversubscribed 10 to 1. So that just gives you an indication of the need out there um, to secure this. So uh, one of the differences is even though building in California is expensive, it's expensive for market rate developers. That's why you know we can't go out and buy a home for three hundred thousand. We're going to be paying a lot because it costs them, and they also got to you know have to make a profit on top of that. Um, so it's just expensive to build in California, but. What's unique about affordable housing is that for market rate developers, uh, they're able to sometimes, you know, move quicker because they, you know, their their conventional um, funding stack to build their housing is regular debt and then equity that they bring in. They don't sort of have all these layers and aren't waiting on these cycles to apply for one application and apply to the next one. Compared to affordable housing which um, has this unique piece, the piece in yellow, which again is the soft sources. And that's the, the bit of um, financing that, you know, adds time and gets expensive. Right, so maybe, um, I know we need to speed this up so we can get to a lot of questions that are in the chat, but um, one of the things people ask me about is why is it so slow and expensive to build affordable housing? And so a lot of it has to do with that stacking thing that Nicole just explained. So there isn't just one place we can go for our financing. There's usually five places we have to go for our financing and they all happen at different times. And so when we're working with um, people who work in our public agencies, like the planning department, building and safety, the finance department, like LEHD, we are always pushing to get things done quickly because we're cognizant of missing those timelines. So for example, as was mentioned, the 9% timeline, it's only twice a year. So if you miss it, you might push your project back nine months, six to nine months. Um, and the reason that's important, not only does that slow it down and people need to get housed, but there's carrying costs um, that go along with um, waiting longer. So, you know, if I, I, many times I have to buy land before I start working on my entitlements and my funding sources, because in this market, there's not many people who are just going to wait for three years while you do all that. They want you to buy it now. And we compete on the open marketplace with everyone 
anyone else to purchase land. So for example, I bought a piece of land in Westchester that was $9 million and I had to hold it for two years until I start two, three years until I started construction. And we have to pay interest that whole time. So right away, you can see how time is a cost driver. Um, in, in other things, too, we have to negotiate with the community um, to gain acceptance. And speaking on that project that I just mentioned, you know, communities push back a lot when it comes to things like parking and traffic. So usually one of the first things they say, well, this is going to bring so much traffic to this area and we don't want it. Um, and by the same token, they say we don't want them parking on our streets, so we have to provide parking. With all of the new bills that have come out, it's not really required to provide much parking anymore. Um, but I frequently put in more parking than I need to because of the community pushback. To give you a sense, um, it costs about $60,000 to construct one underground parking space. So every time I concede to the community or whoever it is that I have to put in more parking, it's real dollars. So these are all the things that, that sort of add on. Um, the other thing, for example, our projects pay prevailing wage, which is a higher wage rate um, for our construction workers, which market rate projects don't have to pay for. So that does add some cost, although from a policy perspective, we do believe in paying a living wage. Um, in addition, our projects frequently, because we're competing, have to do things like go above and beyond. So, you know, lead silver is not good enough. You know, we've got to be top tier projects to compete for funding. So you've got to be lead platinum, all electric, maybe not that extreme, but you know what I'm saying? Like, we really have to make sure we're pushing all the different policy goals that are set by these funding agencies. So let's move on a little more quickly so we can get to questions. So the other thing I want to mention, because a lot of people say, well, can't you just buy a bunch of buildings? Why do we always have to build more new housing? One of the complexities, this is a building I bought in Santa Monica about four years ago, some of the problem is that even though they might look like substandard buildings, it doesn't mean everyone who's living there is low income. And so like in this particular building, there are plenty of people who are over income, so they don't meet that 30 to 80 percent area median income. So therefore, I can't get certain types of financing on this project, such as tax credits. So it's not that it can't be done. It's just that you know some of you might have to think of other funding sources or find different ways to to get it done. And, and at least us, we really don't want to displace people. So we don't want to kick them out if they're over income. We'd rather try to find a way around it. So it just becomes a lot more complex. And of course, you're also rehabbing somebody's home where they live so that you have to either relocate them or they need to live um, in a construction environment, which everyone knows is not fun. So, you know, we do want to try to figure out how to do projects like this, but we need more patience from the funding agencies to help us think through how to be successful with that. So, yeah, so how do we bring the cost down? Well, a lot of us here work on policy, including Nicole, myself, and probably many of you, and the streamlining really does help. So the thing I mentioned earlier about the stacking, if we can, you know, shorten the timeframes of everything we need to do in order to get the financing done, that is going to bring down costs. Absolutely. If I could shave a year off, that would translate into hundreds of thousands of dollars I could save. Um, certainly looking at using current public assets like city owned land or agency owned land would be a great benefit so that we don't have to pay top dollar for the land. Um, we're actually working with some churches um, to try to get some better economies on the land so that, you know, is one way we're trying to look at that. Um, the parking, as I mentioned, if we could do less parking, that certainly would help, but um, that's, like I said, a negotiation with the community. Density helps. So, you know, some people don't like the word density. Some communities don't want to see upzoning happen, um, but it really does reduce costs, as I illustrated with the first example of Las Flores. More units on the same site means less cost many times. Now, not in every case. So if you're building, say, a 10-story building, you're going to have a very complicated type of structure that will probably overall increase your costs. So one of the things as developers we have to look at is trying to find the fine balance of all of that. Um, let's move on. All right, great. We do have 15 minutes for Q&A, which is great because I am seeing a lot of really good questions in the chat. All right. Well, thank you, Tara and Nicole.
Um, I'm going to start with one question that I see commonly, and it's how do you decide who your tenants are and how does an affordable housing developer find those tenants? The right, okay, great question. And that can be different depending on the jurisdiction. For example, in the city of Santa Monica, everyone goes through the city's affordable housing list. So you, you apply directly on the city's website and it will give you all of the options that are available as they come up. Um, we uh, we screen for income primarily because obviously we're trying to serve people of lower incomes. Beyond that, the screening um, isn't, you know, we don't do a ton of screening. We do screen out things um, like sex offenders um, because we have children living in our buildings, you know, really serious crimes, um, you know, but some of that is also dictated by funding sources. So there may be slight differential, but we really don't do a lot of screening aside from income and those really egregious things that I just mentioned. Um, in the city of Los Angeles, it's a lottery. So um, our last building in Mar Vista, we had 50 units. We held an open lottery. There were 8,000 applicants. I mean, it's really heartbreaking, honestly. So it's just a random lottery and then you put people on a waiting list. Um, so yeah, so that's how we select our tenants. And you you publicize, you know, most of the time, local newspapers, one, um, you know, community partners, like a community center. I know, you know, I've seen that. And it's just to get the word out that there's this opportunity out there. Right. And then in city of Los Angeles, we have the coordinated entry system for um, people who are experiencing homelessness. So if that's a component of the project, which many projects have that, then we pull from that list for those units. So I have a quick question for you both, and it's summarizing a few of the questions in the Q&A box. So um, going back to NIMBY opposition or just opposition in general to a project, how do you like what impact does that have on the financials of a project and in what ways does it prohibit effective development? And then also, are there any laws in place that are currently prohibiting effective development as well? You want to start or you want me to, Nicole? I mean, so the way NIMBY can affect it is that it can uh, impact the timeline and again, just make it longer because at least in the jurisdictions where I've worked, um, you know, nobody, the city council doesn't want to approve a project that has a ton of opposition. Um, so there's going to be, it's going to get dragged out a little bit longer because there's going to be more um, communication, you know, perhaps with the opposition. Um, so it's not just, you know, uh, coming in, approve my development and there, off you go. Um, and then, you know, it's, you're going to, as a developer, you're going to have to invest more time and manpower to reach out to those folks. You know, you're spending time talking to the community. You're spending time talking to the folks who are going to make a decision. Uh, you might have to go back to the drawing board, depending on what the opposition raises. And if it's something that you can address, you know, of course, being a good partner, you want to address. So that may cause some tweaks to what you're trying to get approved. Um, so it definitely, you know, just thinking about it from the front end um, can add more time, which adds a little more cost. Yeah. And the example I mentioned earlier of adding parking, I've literally done that for projects that, and that adds cost. Also design considerations. So that same project I keep mentioning because there was a lot of community engagement, I had to step it down. So um which is not efficient. So I stepped the design of the building from five stories along the street to two stories fronting or abutting the neighbors. So not the most efficient design, you know, it's much more efficient to build in stacks and more uniformly. So, but I made that design concession. Um, we also do things like add additional landscaping, which sometimes adds cost, although I'm always a fan of landscaping. So, so I don't mind, but really it's the timelines. I mean, on the, the, the nicer end is what Nicole was saying on the worst end, people sue. People can stop projects by slapping lawsuits or seek what, you know, complaints against projects. I've seen it numerous times and it can push your project back three to 10 years. So that those are some of the ways the NIMBYs, you know, add cost to our projects. Right. And laws have come into place. There's more now than before that basically say you can't deny a project unless there's like significant health and safety concerns, findings, 
but not just because you don't want this housing to come into your neighborhood. You don't like this. You don't like the folks living there. You know, who's going to live there, that type of thing. Um, so there are a few logouts on the book, which again, is part of that streamlining effort and to make it easier to um, improve just the general approval process, which everybody has to go through. Yeah, I can't really think of any laws right now that would make it harder for us to build. Um, I would say that on the contrary, we've gotten lots of bills that help. So SB 35 has been a great one, AB 1763, you know, some of those, we actually use those and they help a lot. Right, density bonus laws. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Um, someone wants to know what are the main differences between nonprofit affordable housing developers and for-profit developers who do affordable housing? Maybe I'll let Nicole do that one. <laughs> um, so I've worked for both. Um, and I would say, so um, when I worked for a for-profit housing developer, it was what I was talking about to finance the project. Um, and this was a few years ago, so I don't know if this changed, but they didn't really need to tap into local resources. They pretty much just were able to make the projects work um, with conventional debt um, and equity. And so in that way, they were able to move faster, be more efficient. Um, I think, you know, they also were really good about having their design program in place. Um, so it wasn't that they were doing cookie cutter projects, but I would say it was less uniquely tailored to the community, maybe than some of the nonprofit groups that I've worked at. I mean, it was still a very good product, um, but you know, they did work with certain architects, sort of have the design program, and unless it was necessitated, necessitated by the community or kind of the design efforts, um, they sort of had what they build. So I think there was efficiency there. And, you know, I mean, there is, we like to say in the nonprofit field, there's the double bottom line, there's the mission, and, you know, the nonprofit does have to make a profit because it has to pay its staff and be able to do this over and over again. Um, but, yeah, I would say that's some of, you know, kind of the differences. Um, and at least the company I worked for, it was, um, you know, there was a group that did uh, the site acquisition um, and, you know, got the project approved. Then it was sort of handed off to finance, which was the application, like tax credit application and closings. And then it went to another group. I think in nonprofits, um, they sort of have, a staff person that uh, kind of stays with the project from the beginning almost through the end and through all those different cycles. So that was something a little bit different. You know, one thing that stands out um, is the idea that nonprofit developers, you know, sometimes they provide supportive services on site. We have a few questions about that in the chat. Um, can you guys talk about you know, who pays for the supportive services when they're provided on site? And when it comes to property management and, and, and hiring those services, are you providing it? Are you hiring a third party? Can you talk about that process? Sure. Um, so it depends on the types of supportive services. So if it's service coordination, which is what we call kind of just the regular affordable housing that's not, you know, deeply targeted, then usually um, it's paid for partially out of the cash flow of the building and then partially from the organization's pockets. So um, and then in the case of the supportive housing, which is the more deeply targeted kind of more wraparound type of services, those usually are paid for by contracts through, say, Measure H or different um, county funding contracts, um, or, you know, and part of it can be paid from the project cash flow as well. And are you hiring, um, who's providing those services? Oh, yes. Um, so for, in the case of us, we're providing those services, but what we do is we partner with other um, service providers in the area to bring in, say, workshops. Like we work with Providence St. John's who brings in certain like health workshops or Wise and Healthy Aging to do senior workshops. Um, I think some groups, they just totally outsource their services to dedicated service providers. So, you know, it's done a few different ways. 
And that includes property manager or property management. So for us, we do our own property management and some of the other nonprofits do as well, but there are some who just third party the property management. Another question is what happens once the covenant expires on an affordable housing property? How does it, is it kept affordable after that or what happens next? Nicole, do you want to answer that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, you know, back in the day, TCAC only like their reg agreement only went for 15 years. Um, and so I think, so the properties that I've seen that have those, again, this is kind of one of the upsides benefits to the affordable housing nonprofit model is that the nonprofit just continues to own it um, and keep it affordable. You know, they don't, um, they don't sell it. They're not in there to, you know, flip it and turn a profit on the building. They don't kick their residents out. Um, but it just, uh, you know, it, it's just remains in the ownership of the nonprofit. Um, and what ends up happening though, is over time, you know, and this goes back to those rehab projects, over time, the property needs um, major repairs, major rehab. And the ideal scenario is that then, you know, um, whether a project received tax credits, at, you know, when it first started or not, and those covenants have expired, the ideal scenario is that they're able to then either refinance it um, or syndicate it or resyndicate it, meaning applying for tax credits. Uh, to be able to get a new infusion of cash to do something substantial in the property. Uh, and then what happens in that case is then they all these covenants come back. And now they have, so even a property that has 15 years, if they, you know, at some point after that 15 years applied for tax credits, now they're getting a 55 year covenant. So some of those like early ones, do, you know, have burned off. And at least for most of the groups that we work with, you know, the nonprofits that we're familiar with, um, they just hold on to the property, uh, but they need to eventually find some way to, um, you know, get an infusion of more funds to be able to do those major repairs and rehab work that is needed. Um, one, I think we have time for one or two more questions, but there was one question in the chat that I also am pretty interested in is what about all these commercially available spaces following, you know, COVID there's all this office space. There's all these buildings around town, how easy, or what's the probability of being able to take those and convert them into housing? Yeah, I don't know if anyone's really tried to do that yet. I mean, I've looked at some buildings on the west side and they're just so out of range in terms of the cost to acquire them that it doesn't make sense for us. It might make sense in some of the less expensive markets, but I don't know anyone who's doing it. Um, someone had a question about the role of philanthropy and foundations and healthcare organizations and helping to fill funding gaps. Is that something that is frequent um, in affordable housing financing and development? And how does it help? I mean, I've I've seen it more on the services front. Most of the foundations that I'm aware of really want to um, provide service dollars for like homeless services. We did actually get some capital for construction of our modular project um, from a philanthropic group, and but that was the first time I've ever seen that happen. Yeah, I would say it's, it's difficult. It's not that common and you have to fundraise a lot. So I'm actually working um, for a project that has Project Home Key funding. Um, and is now ready to build. And the project, you know, raised more than $10 million from, you know, fundraising. Um, so, and it also has um, state HCD money. And, but, you know, you can imagine that <laughs> raising more than that 10 million took a lot of effort. And while it's this one project, um, it's not a model that's likely to be replicated at the scale that's needed to address the housing need. Um, so I think, you know, it's good. It's out there. It can happen. Um, but it's not going to be, you know, in the volume and to the level that's needed to produce all that housing. 
Well, we reached the two o'clock mark. We still have a bunch of questions in the chat. So I hope that you guys can send it to me when I send the follow-up email out to everyone. Just want to give a big thanks to Tara and Nicole for presenting today. There's so much to dig in in these conversations, and we're grateful for you taking the time to talk with us. For everyone that's attending today, you'll get a copy of the slides and a recording from today's session. Um, and we hope to continue these conversations. We have more uh, of these core back to the basics talks coming up the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for those in the email I send out to all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you.